Hi, this is Paramdeep from Pristine and in this session we'll speak about the expectation of the enterprise. When I speak about the expectation, essentially the expectation of return of the enterprise. So if you remember till this point of time, uh, we have spoken about the valuation being driven by three primary things. The first being cash, right? So if I were to speak about valuation, it's the first thing that drives valuation is cash. Essentially, when I say cash, not the accounting cash, but the free cash flow to the firm or the free cash flow to the equity. Uh, the second thing that drives valuation is their expectation of return. And the third thing that drives valuation is the time, the time at which the cash comes to you. We have already spoken about how to calculate the free cash flow to the firm and the free cash flow to the equity. So now we will speak about the expectation of return. If you remember in the last tutorial, we speak about the expectation of return from the equity holders. So what do the equity holders expect? The equity holders expect that apart from the risk free rate, they also get a premium for the additional risk that they are taking and this can also be written as RF plus so the risk free rate plus beta into RM minus RF so this is the additional uh, return because they invest in the market and this is the sort of uh, multiplier effect because of the individual stock and uh, beta if you remember was essentially covariance of RM and RI divided by the variance in RI. So that's what we have discussed till now. We have also discussed how to calculate the free cash flow to the firm and the free cash flow to the equity. So if I were to recap, how do you calculate the free cash flow to the firm? This is essentially going to be my earning before interest in tax, my EBIT. So that, that's what's going to flow into the equity uh, investors as well as the uh, debt investors. So my interest is still with the firm. But I have to pay a tax on this. So EBIT into 1 minus T that goes to the government authorities. Plus if you remember depreciation is not a cash expense. So I add that back. Less anything that goes in the form of working capital requirement. The additional working capital investment. Less the additional investment in the fix assets is that okay so that's what my free cash flow to the firm is and if we were to speak about the equity holders essentially i add i add back the debt that is coming into the firm and i take out the interest payments and the uh, and the uh, principal repayments to get to the free cash flow to the equity holders so that's what we have discussed till now now we are going to discuss the expectation of return from the firm perspective so if I were to show you in a diagram, essentially now I want to know what these equity, uh, what these equity and the debt investor combine. If I were to utilize the full assets of the firm, keeping aside the financing decision, right? So I am not really concerned about how much debt the company has taken at this point of time. As a firm, what's their expectation of return? So this is what I am concerned about now. So I am concerned about the return expectation from the complete assets of the firm. That's basically the debt and the equity combined. So now if I were to speak from the firm perspective, there are essentially two kinds of asset holders in the firm. Whenever we speak, we will always speak about the market values of these assets, right? So there are essentially two kinds of uh, liabilities to match those assets. The first liability is the equity that the company has. We have already calculated their expectation of return. So their expectation of return, let's call it RE. We already know that this is going to be equivalent to RF plus beta multiplied by RM minus RF. So that's their expectation of return. Apart from that, there is obviously debt that the company has. And as far as the debt is concerned, their expectation of return is very clear. So they want, let's say, a return on debt. So they would, let's say, if, if, if you are holding a debt instrument that requires you to pay, let's say, 8% interest per annum, right? 
then obviously RD, the return expectation of the debt holders is 8%. This is relatively simpler to understand as compared to the equity holders because for the debt holders, their risk is limited. Their downside is limited and that limits their upside also. So their downside or the upside is more or less not, uh, not uh, sort of linked to the market returns. They are expecting a fixed return. So my RE is this. Let's assume that the RE is going to be, let's say, 12%. If the RD is 8%, typically I told you that RE is always going to be more than uh, the return expectation of the debt because the equity holders are taking additional risk. So to compensate for the additional risk, they would obviously demand a higher return, right? So I am assuming that the return demanded by the equity investors is going to be more as compared to the return demanded by the debt investors, right? Now let's assume that the firm uh, has essentially, uh, let's say $100 million of equity, or, or or let's say this is the weight of the equity holders, right? The weight uh, of the uh, sort of uh, uh, of the over, overall value of the equity investors. And let's assume that right now the debt is $50 million. So the weight of debt is, let's say, $50 million. So, so essentially, this is the total value of debt. The weights are going to be in the ratio of 3 is to, uh, sorry, 2 is to 1, right? So if, if I have 2 million of uh, equity, then I have essentially 1 million of debt, right? So this is the overall debt that the firm has. Now, if I'm speaking about the expectation of the firm overall, that would be derived from two parts, the expectation of the equity holders and the expectation of the debt holders. And obviously, uh, uh, as in the overall expectation of the firm, also called the weighted average cost of capital, so this is called the weighted average cost of capital is, is going to be sort of a weighted average of their expectation. So, so we can say that it's, it's going to be sort of the market value of the equity. So I am speaking about the weight of equity, right? So divided by the weight of equity plus the weight of debt. So that's the total amount of uh, sort of percentage of equity that you have multiplied by the return of the uh, multiplied by the expectation of the equity investors plus the weight of debt divided by the weight of equity plus the weight of debt multiplied by the return expectations of the debt holders. But please note that if I'm operating as a firm, then on this debt, I'm going to get a tax shield. So if, if this is what is paid to the debt investors, I get a tax shield on this, right? So in effect, I'm just paying multiplied by 1 minus T. So that's the overall weighted average cost of capital for the firm, right? So so if you have understood this, uh, then sort of let's let's try to see how we are going to implement this in a small model. So we have a return expectation of the equity investors. So let's call this RE. So let's first of all make some assumptions, right? So let's reduce the size. Let's increase the size. You hide the grid. So my return expectation of the equity investors is let's say 12%. So that you can get from the CAPM model or uh, essentially RF plus beta into RM minus RF, right? So my weight of debt or the overall equity that the company has is let's say $100 million, right? So it's basically $100 million. My debt, uh, the, the cost of debt is let's say 8%, right? And uh, the overall debt that the firm has is let's say $50 million, right? And apart from that, the tax rate that I have is, let's say, uh, 30%, right? So the first calculation that I'm going to do is the effective uh, sort of uh, cost of debt. So I can say effective cost of debt. Since uh, the interest payments are going to have a, 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 a sort of saving on the tax part, so the effective cost of debt is always going to be 1 minus the tax rate. 
multiplied by the overall cost of debt. So although you pay an interest of say, sort of 8%, but not that's not paid on the overall uh, sort of overall uh, overall uh, debt that you have, overall in, um, debt that you have. You essentially take that out of the uh, uh, if uh, out of the uh, profit before tax so if you remember you have your EBIT so from that you deduct the uh, the interest first then you get the profit before tax from that you deduct the tax right and then you get your profit after tax so if my EBIT is let's say a hundred and my interest is 10 then my PBT is always going to be 100 minus 10 and if my tax rate is 30%, so it's going to be 30% multiplied by the PBT. And my PAD is going to be equivalent to my PBT less the tax. So out here, uh, sort of, uh, although I am paying uh, a, a, an interest of 10, but uh, finally, sort of the tax on that, uh, the tax that you have overall, if, if this interest was zero, right, would be much more. It would actually be 30, right? But since I am paying an interest of 10, so I pay a tax of only 27, right? If the interest was 0, then the tax would have been 30. But now that the interest is 10, the tax reduces to 27. So my effective tax that I have, so my effective tax that I have is essentially equivalent to 1 minus the, uh, the tax rate multiplied by the interest. So this is the effective sort of uh, interest that I have, not the effective tax, but the effective interest, right? Because if you see that the interest is zero, then your uh, profit, uh, then your tax becomes 30, right? Whereas if my interest is 10, then the tax becomes 27. So I in, in fact save three dollars on that, and that means that my effective interest is not really 10; it is actually seven only. Similarly, out here. I've calculated the effective cost of debt as 1 minus T into the overall interest that I'm going to pay, right? So I hope that you have understood this. This is an important concept. So you always have to take the cost of debt post the tax. Is that okay? Getting the tax shield in place. So if I were to calculate the weighted average cost of capital, that's going to be equivalent to, first of all, let's calculate. Uh, so let's do it in two steps. Let's calculate the weight of equity so my weight of equity is essentially my overall value of equity divided by the total equity that I have plus the debt that I have is that okay so my weight of equity is 67 percent right if I were to calculate the weight of debt that's always going to be equivalent to 1 minus the weight of equity that I have right so what is my weighted average cost of capital it's going to be equivalent to my weight of equity multiplied by the expectation of the equity investors plus the weight of debt multiplied by the expectation of the debt investors. But that's not really what you pay as a firm. You pay just the effective cost of debt. Is that okay? So your overall weighted average cost of capital is... Uh, is around 9.9% as compared to the ex equity investors who were expecting overall 12%. So let me write this uh, these formulas so that you get a clear understanding of what's happening. And then we'll have a short discussion around these formulas as well. Right, so what I've done in effect is that uh, the first thing that we spoke about is an effective cost of debt. That you can derive from this place as well. So as you can see, the effective interest that I pay is, is only $7 instead of the $10. Because if I were paying a zero interest, then my tax would have been 30, right? But now that I'm paying an interest of $10, my tax is 27. That means that my effective interest is 10 minus 7. That is a 10 minus 3. Because original interest was 30. The new interest is just 27. Because of the interest that you pay. 
that means that effectively you have paid an interest of only seven dollars right so if i were to calculate this effective cost of debt that's going to be equivalent to one minus the tax rate multiplied by the cost of debt the weight of equity obviously how much equity you hold as compared to the total capital that you hold right the weight of debt obviously 100 percent less the overall equity that you have and then i just state the weighted average of these two to get to the final number the other formula that could have been useful in case uh, we had uh, arranged that uh, slightly differently so let me show you an alternate calculation that could have been there so let's first of all use both the weighted uh, equity and the debt and then let's use the uh, uh, the uh, cost of equity and then let's use the cost of debt right so my weight of equity is uh, 67 percent my weight of debt is 33 percent my cost of equity is let's say 12 percent and the cost of debt is effective cost of debt is six percent so if i were to calculate vac i could have also used this formula called sum product right so i have the different weights and i have the different costs right so you can also use this uh, uh, this formula of sum product obviously out here since the number of items is low you can simply multiply them and, and then get the answer but let's say if we had 10 different uh, sort of liabilities in place and each one of them had a different expectation then we could have simply used this formula called sum product <clears throat> and then we have we could have got to the we could have got to the result is that okay so you can also use this formula called the sum product in case your uh, your uh, sort of uh, the numbers are aligned properly right so this is a very useful formula sometimes uh, because in case the number of items are large and you want to calculate a weighted average then uh, then the sum product could be a very very useful function right so so that gets me to my weighted average cost of capital please note that weighted average cost of capital is the expectation of the firm this is not the expectation of the equity holders this is expectation of the complete firm so if we were to speak about the valuation from the complete firm perspective, then we would always be discounting the free cash flow to the firm by the weighted average cost of capital to get to the final valuation numbers. Is that okay? So uh, if we were to sort of recap, then uh, the valuation is to be derived by two parts, the f uh, three parts in fact. The first is the cash which could either be the free cash flow to the firm or the free cash flow to the equity. Again, if you are using free cash flow to the equity, then you have to discount it by the expectation of the equity investors. If you are using free cash flow to the firm, then you have to discount it by the expectation of the firm, which is weighted average cost of capital. And that's essentially equivalent to the return expectation of the equity investors multiplied by the weight of the equity investors. So the weight of the equity divided by the weight of equity plus the weight of debt, right? Plus the return expectation of the debt holders multiplied by the weight of debt divided by the weight of equity plus the weight of debt. Please note that these are all market values of debt. So obviously if you are using the return on debt, then you will also get a tax shield on that. That is basically one minus T. So that completes most of the uh, conceptual part as, as, as far as uh, uh, valuation is concerned there is just one more part left that's basically the terminal value that we have to speak about apart from that as far as the concept is concerned uh, we are almost through so i do hope that you have understood uh, how to get to the expectation of the equity investors as well as the firm i do hope that you found the tutorial to be useful if you have any questions feel free to write an email to me on paramdeep at edupristine.com Alternatively, you could call me on plus 919890806080. I do hope that you found the tutorial to be useful and I look forward to seeing you in the next tutorial. Thank you and bye-bye.